I speak to you in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sanctifier. Amen. So writing a sermon for today was somewhat difficult, even though the readings of today are the best for a deacon to preach from. By now, many of you, I'm sure, know that I will be leaving Christ Church Cathedral January 7th. I'm moving to Arlington, Mass. to be near my family. And as I said to you in the letter I sent, deacons are meant to be a part of a congregation for three years, extended to six, but then move on. During that time, we work to bring the needs of the world to the church and the church to the world. And I believe we've begun some really important work together, both in worshiping God and in outreach to the broader life in Springfield. The drop-in center is thriving and it gets busier each week. The week before Thanksgiving, we were closed this week, we had more than 75 guests and the washers and dryers were going until after two o'clock. We close at one. Now the prophet Ezekiel was upset at the way leaders were taking advantage of the poor. And Ezekiel is looking forward to the time when God will take care of his people, the sheep of Israel. Ezekiel tells us that God promised to rescue them from all places, gather them, feed them on rich pasture, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bind up the injured, strengthen the weak, but the fat and strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And then Matthew's gospel, some six centuries later, King David, long deceased, Jesus has come as that new shepherd. And remember who Jesus chose as his disciples. He didn't choose the wealthy and the educated. He chose common, flawed, ordinary people. Now, over the past few weeks, we have heard several of the parables Jesus uses to teach those flawed people how to live into God's kingdom. Jesus is nearing the end of his earthly ministry. Today is the end of our church year, Christ the King. And we hear a summary of Jesus' teaching in the 25th chapter of Matthew. This is the final story in Matthew before the Last Supper, Crucifixion, and Resurrection. In Matthew, in this, these verses, I hear one of my favorite verses from the Old Testament, and it comes from Micah. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Today's gospel could not be any clearer in the direction of how we are to live our lives as if we call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ. We hear an urgency in today's gospel and it's the only gospel version where Jesus is talking about the final judgment. It's not in any other gospel. Also, nowhere else in the Bible is something said four times in 10 verses. It's how we live our lives and that's what we'll be judged on. Will we hear come inherit the kingdom or will we hear depart from me? Now we all do some good things and we all fail at times. With Jesus, there's no middle of the road. There are sheep and there are goats. 
just as there were wise and foolish bridesmaids and trustworthy and untrustworthy servants. We are accountable for our own actions. As I often do, I like to do this, I take you back to the questions that we responded to in our baptismal covenant. Every time we renew that baptismal covenant, do we follow the apostles' teaching and fellowship? Do we resist evil and sincerely repent when we have gone astray? Do we proclaim by word and example the good news of Christ? Do we take the best care of the earth as we possibly can? Do we seek and serve Christ in all people? And the big one for me, do we strive for justice and peace among all people, respecting the dignity of every human being? These pesky questions are the ones we need to hear and respond to. Those are the demands I hear in today's gospel. Matthew goes back to the basics. Give food to the hungry. Give water to the thirsty. Welcome the stranger. Clothe the naked. Care for the sick. And visit those in prison. In God's dream of this world, people are kind, compassionate, and care for each other. There is no war. We love our neighbors, so nobody is left out. Now, we know that our world has an abundance. There's enough for everyone. Yet we have people dying of thirst, starvation, because people can't get the medicine they need or a roof over their heads. People are dying because they live in places of war, famine, poverty. What God calls us to should be easy, but we know it isn't. We accept the comfortable lifestyle built on consumerism. I know that I do. We accept that there are winners and losers. We don't correct misinformation, and we vote for leaders who care for themselves and the power that they can gain. We allow laws that are more of a burden on the poor than on the rich. We tolerate isolationism. We allow people to go hungry. We allow discrimination without calling it out. How often do we simply cross the street? Now today, we celebrate Scottish Heritage Sunday. And without Samuel Seabury and the Scottish bishops, we would not be the Episcopal Church here, but would still owe an allegiance to the King of England. So we owe a great debt to Samuel Seabury. At the same time, we must recognize that Samuel Seabury was a slave owner, which then was the structural system and an accepted business practice. Today, we know better. We can no longer be complicit with those structural systems that allow people to be in situations where there is no way out. What we say, we're a Christian nation, and we ask, what would Jesus do? And yet, if we don't care for the needy, we are not doing what Jesus would do. The mission of the church needs to be outward, the focus outward, compassion for those around us. In everything we do, in every song we sing, in every prayer we pray, when we're developing the budget, the programming, how are we following our baptismal covenant? How are we caring for the least of these? In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, we hear a profound call to live our lives in Christ. Paul's words, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, 
so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. In response to that prayer, Henry Nouwen says, this prayer makes clear that the spiritual life is guided by the same spirit who guided Jesus Christ. The spirit is the breath of Christ in us, the divine power of Christ active in us, the mysterious source of new vitality by which we are made aware that it is not we who live, but Christ who lives in us. It is not enough to try to imitate Christ. It is not enough to remind others of Jesus. It is not even enough to be inspired by the words and actions of Jesus. No, the spiritual life presents us with a far more radical demand to be living Christ here and now, in this time and in this part of history. St. Teresa of Avila, the 16th century Spanish nun said, Christ has no body now on earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the same eyes through which Christ's compassion is to look out into the world. Yours are the feet with which Christ is to go about doing good. Yours are the hands with which Christ is to bless all people now. At the end of time, we will be asked how we responded to those around us. What were the tangible ways we can say that we gave food to the hungry, water to the thirsty, welcomed the stranger, clothed the naked, cared for the sick, and visited those in prison. Amen. Amen.